our Bibles this morning to uh, James chapter 1. And James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, our Lord. Uh, and uh, he was the brother of our Lord, a half-brother of our Lord. In fact, in Matthew 13, 55, it said, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is, is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And uh, James, he had a special resurrection visit by Jesus. Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. He said after that he was seen by James. And that's, so tradition says that uh, James was quite a man of prayer. <clears throat> in fact, they called him old camel knees. Can you imagine spending so much time on your knees in prayer that your knees get calloused? I pray often from my lazy boy. Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> The callus has come to the wrong place. So anyway, uh, he, he had uh, knees that looked like a camel, called old camel knees. So he had a real, a real prayer life. And uh, the book of James has two basic themes, uh, how to handle persecution inside and outside the church, and uh, also to, to show our faith through our works. And some misinterpret James and to think he's saying that we are, we're saved by our works. That's not what he says. He says that the same faith that saves us leads us to do good deeds, to do good works, that, and that's what shows our faith to other people. Uh, now, our justification uh, co concerns our standing before God. Our, our works show our faith to a fallen world out there. I mean, look at what we just saw on the screen of these boxes going out across the world uh, as a profession of love to, to these children everywhere in the world. In verse 1, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So it's a letter to Jewish Christians scattered abroad in the dispersion. Uh, there are Jews who had left uh Jerusalem because of persecution. You know, Christianity was not that well accepted. It was uh, a full, Jesus was a fulfillment of the law. So he was telling them, get rid of the law and come into faith in Christ. And many were, many more were scattered at the death of uh, Stephen, the first martyr in the early church. Remember, Paul was there, the apostle Paul. He was Saul of Tarsus then, and he was holding the coats of those people that were throwing the rocks. And this letter is to the <coughs> Christian Jews scattered throughout the Roman Empire, written around the year 50, with no other digits in front of it, 50 AD. And interesting, he calls himself a bondservant of God in his Lord Jesus Christ. The bondservant is called a doulos. It's a slave. It's someone in permanent servitude to someone else. And it's, it, it was really a degrading name because it was the lowest position on the social ladder. In fact, John the Baptist said in Mark 1, 7, There comes one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. What he's doing is he's describing the lowliest job there was, the doulos. He was the one that met you at the door, a slave that would take off your sandals and wash your feet. So he goes on in verse 2 and says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be uh, perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, Jesus, James says here, when you fall into trials, not if. And if we've lived long enough to know that it's just a matter of time when that when happens, when we fall into trials. He's saying, you know, this is an opportunity for joy, not just a resignation, uh, a discouraged resignation that uh, uh, we just have to take it. Oh, you know, woe is me. It, it's, it's used to produce patience, he says. It's a realization that God is growing me. He's purifying me. He's giving me an opportunity to grow in the manner in which I face these trials. And patience isn't just passive waiting, but it's active endurance, uh, like the endurance that's needed to run a long race. As a cross-country runner years ago, you wouldn't know it now, but I used to run cross-country, and that took, you had to set a pace, you had to keep going, and you had to wait till you got to the finish line. 
But the idea here is uh, it's also a picture of being under a heavy load and resolving to stay there instead of trying to escape from it. Oftentimes uh, we think about, Lord, get me out of this, instead of, Lord, what do I need to get out of this? What, In other words, what do I need to learn? Because if, if the Lord's allowed it, he's designed it, that we might grow from it. Hard lesson. <clears throat> Someone said, if you don't have ulcers, you're not carrying your share of the load. load. That's, you know, Actually, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's what he says. Not uh, that we should have ulcers as a result of it. We should be giving it to the Lord. And faith is tested through trials, not produced by trials. Trials reveal our faith to ourselves and, and to others. And it's easy to talk about our faith in God when things are easy. But our faith is really shown in the midst of trials that James is talking about here. An important principle is that when trials come, patience doesn't always come. Our, some, if our trials are received with unbelief and, and grumbling, uh, we can become bitter. We can become discouraged. We can become angry. That's why James says, count it all joy. Also keep in mind, he did, didn't say we must feel it all joy, or trials are all joy, but he's saying during these trials, be joyful. When trials come, God wants to be our first source, our first resource, not our last resort. Well, I've tried everything else. Guess i got to pray now. <laughs> And we might even say, you know, I want patient endurance right now, and I want it fast. But the problem is it grows slowly as we mature. It must be allowed to grow so that we can become perfect and complete or, or mature, lacking nothing. And true patience really is waiting without worrying, giving it to the Lord. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We need wisdom to know the will of God. And he's saying to receive wisdom as a believer, all you have to do is ask God. He gives it generously. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't despise our request. And he's already given us the, the foundation of wisdom. It's in the, his word, his revealed word in the Bible. We have that. We can carry it with us in our briefcases, our purses, on our phones, and on our tablets. How do we know if something is true? Hold it up against the word of God. Hold it up against the Bible. We can't use it to tell time, but we can use it to discern the times. Seeking after God's wisdom begins and ends in the scriptures. It's a standard that we are to conform to. And when we ask, he says, when we ask for wisdom, ask in faith. In other words, without doubting. Without God, doubting God's ability to answer, without, God, without doubting God's desire to answer, to give us his wisdom. He doesn't want us to believe him one day and trust in him one day and then not believe him the next day and not trust him in the next day. Or we, he doesn't want us to think, to have that fear, that, well, I've, I don't want to petition God all the time. I can't keep coming back to him. After all, he's busy and I don't want to... I don't want to bother him. Huh. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able to exceeding abundantly, to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Lack of faith is a lack of trust in God. If we lack faith and trust in God, it makes us unstable in all our ways. A man said, <laughs> I like this, in Mark 9.24, he said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You know, I do believe, but help me when I'm feeling weak. Uh, he, he wasn't double-minded. He wanted to believe. He said he believed, but he felt inadequate. He just asked for help with his faith. It's okay to ask God for more faith. Uh, uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't always see it. He doesn't. That's what faith takes, because when we can't see it. Verse 9, he says, Let the brother of poor degree... I'm sorry, let the brother of low degree, meaning poor, <laughs> rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower thereof falls, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. 
so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. I couldn't help but think about, uh, you know, we have some roses growing around our yard, and we, we usually clip the roses and put the flowers in the vase on the table. We don't wait till the petals hit the floor, hit the ground, and then turn all brown and then gather them up and put them in the middle of the table. He's just saying, you know, things, when they're beautiful at one time, they, they degrade. And he's saying that it's appropriate for the poor to rejoice when they're lifted up by God. It's appropriate for the rich to rejoice when they're brought low by trials. It's more difficult, of course, but uh, he's saying, you know, rich people may be very comfortable in this life, but this life fades away. Just like the flowers fade away, just like the leaves fade away, like grass turns brown and, and it all falls and becomes dirt one day. And when a rich man dies outside of Christ, he leaves his riches behind. That old term, you know, there's no uh, U-Hauls behind the hearse. But when a poor man dies in Christ, he goes to his riches and glory. So we have to decide what we want, door one or door two, you know. John D. Rockefeller was a very rich man, and he had three simple rules to get rich. Go to work early, stay at work late, and three, find oil. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Psalm 62.10 says, if riches increased, set not your heart upon them. In other words, don't trust in them. Jesus in his parable of the sower in Mark 4.19 says, And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the world and it becomes unfruitful. The, the wrong attitude toward money can turn us away from the Lord. It's an attitude toward money. It's a tool. It's a tool to be used. Sometimes you may want more in your toolbox, you know, but uh, the Lord determines Verse 12, blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, finished brings forth death do not err my beloved brethren temptation is one of the trials that we faith face and sometimes <clears throat> the bible says we're to flee temptation but what if we can't well then we must endure temptation uh, ephesians six thirteen says wherefore take unto you the whole armor of god that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand the Bible tells us to flee fornication, to flee idolatry, to flee the love of money, to flee youthful lusts. A lot of things that were to run away from us. The Bible tells us to submit ourselves before God. Submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Re resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's a little further ahead in James, in chapter 4, verse 7. The psalmist David says to God in Psalm 143, 9, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I flee Unto thee to hide me. Run from the devil, run from sin, run to the Lord Jesus. They're all similar. As we persevere through temptation, we're proved or tested. Well, where does temptation come from? It doesn't come from God, though he allows it. It's sometimes to test our faith so we and others can see where our faith is. God already knows, but he wants to reveal to ourselves or to others. Temptations used in two senses, uh, solicitation to evil or t testing under trial first look let's look at that temptation to evil first after Jesus' baptism in Matthew 4 1 he said Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil Jesus allowed himself to come face to face with the enemy and to be tempted in chapter 3 of Genesis Adam and Eve are, are t tempted in the garden of Eden uh, the serpent, by the serpent, uh, in the, the devil in the shape of a serpent, serpent. And we have a tendency that when we're in trials to blame God for it. But there's nothing new. <laughs> the Garden of Eden, remember Adam said, it's that woman you gave me. And what does Eve say? The devil made me do it. So, you know, we have, a, we have an inherent problem with accepting responsibility for our own problems. But temptation comes when we're drawn away by our own fleshly desires and enticed, by the world, by the devil, by our own flesh, providing the enticement. Wow. 
Satan can tempt us, but the only reason he hooks us is because of our own fallen nature, corrupting our God-given desires. We take his bait. The whole idea of fishing is to put bait in there and say, here, fishy, fishy, there's food. There's no hook there. Jesus is a fisher of men. Satan's a fisher of men, too, but not to our benefit. It's to hook us through desire into sin. Ungodly desire brings sin. Sin ultimately brings death. Satan won't remind us of this. In fact, he tries to hide this from us. The Bible says that sin is pleasurable for a season, for a while, for a time. Satan says, this isn't going to hurt you. This is good for you. There's no hook here. Like the fisherman going after the fish. But we need to remember that he, he only comes to lie, to steal, to cheat, and to kill and destroy. We should be resisting his tempting lies when we know who he is. Now, the other kind of testing we, or temptation we have is testing under trial. Um, in Genesis 22, Abraham was tested to sacrifice his son Isaac. In Luke 22, uh, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, strained, remember, the night before his crucifixion, and uh, he strained so hard against the cross that beads of sweat uh, were filled with drops of blood that, from the broken capillaries from the strain. He was tested to go to the cross or to avoid it. No matter what the temptation, we can be sure what is said. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it's in the notes, there has no temptation taken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. The word suffer is uh, in the King James. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a desire to escape that you may be able to bear it. He always provides an escape route to and through him. And he can strengthen us. He can prepare us. Ephesians 6, 13, again, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the e in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variables, variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Two principles here. All good things come from God, and God doesn't change. It speaks of a, an attribute of God's, that he's immutable, he's unchangeable in nature and purpose. Malachi chapter 3, the first part of verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. What does this mean? Well, he doesn't change in his nature, and he also doesn't change the rules just for you or I. In other words, we're not an exception to God's provisions. Satan likes to lie and to say, this doesn't apply to you. You know, this sin is, is for others, but not for you. This is sin for others, but not for you, because you're special. You, can, uh, you get to make your own rules here, is what he's saying, and God will bend for you. That's one of the lies Satan has. But God doesn't change for everyone, for anyone, actually, anybody. There's, there's no variableness. He's absolute. He's absolutely good. And God's goodness is constant. There's no variableness in him. There's no variation in him. He's the author. He's the father of lights. In the sky, he has the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he has that spiritual light that comes into us. It's called morality, salvation, glory, the word of God. And God's salvation, I'm sorry, God's goodness is shown in our salvation to save us. As he drew us to him by his Holy Spirit, by his, with his word, the Bible, we could, each of us could get up here and, and share our testimony of that time when the, God turned the light on. And all of a sudden we went, wow, I get it now. We all have a story. Verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, <clears throat> Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not bring about the righteousness, righteousness of God. Well, you've heard it said that we have one mouth, two ears. And you've probably heard from me why that is. It's because we're supposed to listen twice as much as we're supposed to speak. Uh, do we hear people today interrupting one another? 
finishing one another's sentences. Do we ever do that? Listen to the radio sometimes when you have two commentators on. They're constantly talking over one another. Proverbs 18.13 says, He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and shame unto him. Ooh. If we want to be a good listener, we have to be not so quick to answer. In other words, don't finish other people's sentences. Well, unless you're married. Uh, then, then people look at it as a help. Sometimes I need my wife to finish my sentence for me because I can't remember. But also, sometimes we get caught up in what I call springboard conversationalists. As soon as somebody says something, oh, yeah, I remember, and they take the, take the conversation away and speak of what they're doing. Something else comes up, oh, yeah, that, I, I remember that. I did that, too. It's called springboarding. But it's also to be slow to wrath. Don't get angered too quickly. Because the fact is, we don't lose our temper. We find it. That whole con concept of losing our temper is not accurate. I think what we do is we lose our temperance. Temperance is the word for self-control. So what we lose is our self-control and anger comes out. Remember when you take the metal steel and heat it up, when it gets too hot, it loses its temper. Interesting. It loses its strength. Our inner strength comes from God and it's through self-control. So because of our temptation to sin, the goodness of God, we must be careful to be slow to, ang to anger, slow to wrath. Because our anger, our bursts of anger don't accomplish God's righteousness and only defends our own agendas. We can learn to be slow to wrath by first learning to be quick to listen, slow to speak. And think about this. When you really need to talk to someone, do you go to someone who talks a lot or who listens a lot? <laughs> Remember, worthwhile thoughts rarely enter the mind through an open mouth. I need to repeat that? <laughs> I, for me, I do. Worthwhile thoughts rarely need, enter your mind through an open mouth, <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, this is probably a good time to hand out the elements, Bill, because we're getting, as we get close to the end, I want, we're going to do communion at the end. We'll go right into communion. Verse 21, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save souls. Superfluity? superfluity of naughtiness. I don't use that phrase much. It means overflowing of evil, keeping in mind the nature of temptation, the goodness of God. He says, stand firm against the lust of the flesh, filthiness, overflow of wickedness, an impure lifestyle. Lay these things aside. He says, receive the word of God, read the word of God, apply it to our lives in meekness with a teachable heart. Instead of saying, well, that's for somebody else or elbowing the person beside us. Did you hear that? You need to hear that. We need to keep a teachable heart because the word of God will preserve us in an impure age for all of eternity. Second Timothy 4.18, it's in the notes. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So verse 22, our faith is tested uh, to produce patience in us. But patience isn't inactive. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. How do we receive the word of God? To As doers, not just hearers. He says that. If we think that just hearing the Bible, reading it or just hearing it, is enough, and we have nothing more to do than to simply hear it, it's just, we're deceiving ourselves. If we only take the word in and not let it back out again, Never do what it says. One way you could look at it is your spiritual constipation. But the other thing is the, the, the Jordan River, by the way, flows into the Dead Sea. And the reason it's dead is that it doesn't flow back out again. The water doesn't flow out. Can't be a good thing. Jesus, in your notes is Matthew chapter 7, on his Sermon on the Mount said, in verse 24, this is Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto him a 
liken him unto a wise man which built his rock, house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And people who live along the Atlantic Ocean coast or the Pacific Ocean coast realize that if you build your house on sand, it won't last long. So what do they do? They drill pilings down till they hit rock. Good illustration to being founded on the rock of the word of the Lord. So to hear the word without doing it is like that man building on sand. It's unstable. It's temporary. To hear the word of God and do it was like a man who built his house on rocks, solid, permanent, able to withstand those storms of life and, uh, and eternity where we'll be. We need to not be one of those who says, somebody ought to do something about that. <laughs> if we only hear the word of God without doing it, it's like looking in the mirror and forgetting what we saw. Because this morning, you know, I, when I went to the mirror and got frightened for the first time, uh, it's not just to look and admire, no, because you usually have, you have bed head, your hair is going in all directions. Uh, who knows, you may have some jelly on your face from the toast. Uh, uh, the idea is to look so that you can push and pull and wash and brush and get everything looking acceptable to the rest of the world. When we look into the mirror, we, we, do, we do that to do something about it. When we look into God's word, we should be doing it so we can do something about it and do something with it. We need to look into the Word of God, study the Word of God, do the Word of God, and continue in it. That's the point James is making here. He's stressing both reading and studying and doing, and then we'll be blessed. They're all important. I like 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. In the Old Covenant, the Lord revealed the law of Moses. In Paul, the Apostle Paul called it a yoke of bondage. In the New Covenant, God reveals another law, the law of liberty, written on our transformed heart, written on hearts of flesh by the Spirit of God. I like what Paul says in Galatians 5.1. This is the, against the, speaking against the Judaizers, Judaizers who were saying, you must first be a good Jew to become a good Christian. And Jesus plus anything is a, is a a cult or at least a false teaching. But Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. The laws bring us into bondage. We're free in Christ. And then finally, uh, the end of the chapter here. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Here's some examples of what it means to be a doer of the word. Not just knowing about the needs around you, but by filling those needs. Not just by knowing what not to say, but actually not saying it. Not only knowing what to say, but actually saying it. And the idea, he uses a bridle here. The bridle is put on a horse and the part of it goes into the mouth. And the idea is that it can steer the horse so they can't just go anywhere. And that's, uh, we should be bridling our mouth so that the things that come out are clean. And cl- clean speech today is noticeable. Having grown up through the 40s and 50s uh, and 60s, uh, when you couldn't say swear words, everything's allowed on in the movies now and in, in TV. It's almost like there's no filter anymore. It's really sad. But we, as believers, can have, we we can be known by what we don't say oftentimes. And uh, one of the uh, ways hypocrisy in a believer is shown is when we're unable to control our own tongue. Our our work with, our walk with God is, is empty if it doesn't translate into the way we live, the way we treat others. That's what we're here for, to change lives. And a real walk with God shows itself in very practical ways, meeting the needs of those around us, keeping ourselves unstained by the world's corruption. Remember the, remember Lot? He was spotted by the world 
uh, he, he disregarded the spiritual climate of Sodom because there was money to be made there. He eventually moved in. He became part of the city's leadership. The result, he lost everything, barely got out with his life. <laughs> Yogi Berra once said, you got to be careful if you don't know where you're going. you, you got to be careful if you don't know where, you, where you're going because you might not get there. <laughs> Yogi's famous for a lot, of, a lot of great things. What we can say is keep it simple. Don't be corrupted by the world around you. Look around, meet needs. Sometimes the smallest things we do turn out to be the biggest things in some people's lives. And uh, continue in the Word of God, stay with the Word of God, and He will get us there. Let's stand and pray. Oh, I'm sorry, don't stand and pray. My wife just reminded me, yeah, there is one more thing, communion. As Jesus, if you, just, if you bend the front part down, it kind of snaps the two apart. And you can peel the top one off to get the bread the element. We know Jesus is not in the elements. He doesn't have to sacrifice himself over and over. But Jesus, when he was in the upper room of the apostles in the famous Last Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. So he said, this is uh, the representation of my body. It's not literally his body, but the representation of his body that was broken for you. He said, he was nailed to a piece of wood. And he took upon himself, that was, that was the physical suffering, the whippings, the beating, the nailing, spear in the side, the crown of thorns, those are physical. He also took upon himself in a, a, a period of time the sins of all of us. Unable, we, we're unable to measure that or know what it might be like, be like, but he as God's son did it. So let's partake of that representation of Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. Now you peel the second part back, trying not to spill it on your clothing because it does stain. Lord, and uh, Jesus bled at the wound points and the spear that went into his side, it ruptured the pericardial sac that blood and water came out right into his heart. It wasn't a lot of blood. It was the normal amount of blood. It's pints probably more than gallons, but it was enough to cover the sins of the world. The old covenant said that animals need to be sacrificed. Jesus was the one perfect lamb of sacrifice. So let's partake together of that representation of his blood that he gave for us. Lord, we thank you that you were willing to shed your blood for us, that you were willing to take up the punishment of our sins that we deserve. You don't deserve. You're innocent. You were the innocent sacrifice, Lord. Thank you for that. And thank you for opening our eyes, Lord, that we need not wonder if your word is true. And Lord, uh, how sad it makes us when we see the world so lost, so spinning out of control, seeking power or any other thing that the devil might put in their mind. So Lord, I pray that as opportunity presents itself, you would show us where and when to lift your name on high, that others may know that you are Lord. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.